We are done with our chapter on projective varieties, so we're ready to move on to chapter 8, uh, Grassmannians. So in this chapter, we're giving some nice examples of some projective varieties. And we're going to follow kind of the same pattern that we've, we've done so far. We'll describe uh, the things that we're interested in as sets, and then we'll give them the structure of a variety. Uh, this time, uh, we won't have to redefine the structure sheet uh, or to define the structure sheet from scratch like we did with affine varieties and projective varieties. We'll be able to just see the set that we like or that we're interested in uh, as a subset of a projective variety and then it show that it's a closed subset and that it inherits the structure of a, of a projective variety from there. Uh, this is kind of like what we did with the Segre embedding. All right, so we'll be interested in here in Grassmannians. So uh, the Grassmannian will write as a G, K, N, where uh, K and N are positive integers, and K should be uh, smaller than or equal to N. And uh, what is it as a set? It's the, um, it's the set of uh, K dimensional subspaces uh, of, uh, of K N. All right, so this is uh, the notation is a little bad here. This is supposed to be, a, you know, a, a lowercase k. And um, this here, this big k, this capital K, is your ground field. All right, so the set of a uh, little k dimensional subspaces of uh, k to the n, uh, the, the n-dimensional vector space over k. Grassmannians are named for Hermann Grass Grassmann. Um, he was a guy back in the 1800s, I believe in, eight, it says here in 1840, he published an essay that contains the first known appearance of what is now called linear algebra and the notion of a vector space. Uh, it turns out his work uh, wasn't super well received at the time. Uh, uh, the mathematician, mathematical community wasn't quite ready for linear algebra yet. Um, okay, that's your history lesson for today. Let's make a remark that uh, you could also use the Grassmannian as uh, the set of uh, k minus 1 dimensional uh, linear uh, subvarieties of a projective space of dimension n minus 1. All right, so remember in our chapter about projective spaces, we had this correspondence between uh, cones in an affine space and and uh, and projective uh, sub varieties. So let's make a remark that the Grassmannian can also be viewed as the set of a k minus one a dimensional uh, linear uh, sub varieties of uh, the projective space of dimension n minus one. So remember back in our chapter about projective spaces, we had a correspondence between cones in the affine space and uh, sub varieties of a projective space. So that's exactly what's going on here. We're thinking of uh, Kn as, a, as affine space of n dimensions and a, a vector subspace is, is an example of a cone. Of course, not all cones are, are vector subspaces, but vector sub subspaces are cones and they correspond exactly to the linear sub varieties of the projective variety and, and the dimension goes down by one. Before we see the grass line as a projective variety, we need to do a little bit of linear algebra. So here's the definition. Let uh, V and W be vector spaces and um, let F from uh, k copies of V mapping to W uh, be a multilinear map all right so remember multilinear here means it's, it's linear in each of the copies of V right so if you multiply you know one uh, one of the arguments by a scalar then the answer gets multiplied by a scalar and uh, similarly for, for addition okay um, here's the definition. If uh, f if the f is called alternating, all 
alternating if uh, f of v1 through vk is equal to 0 uh, whenever one of the arguments is repeated. So whenever um, vi equals vj for some i not equal to j. Okay, um, the reason this is called alternating is because of the following remark. Um, if you take f of uh, u plus v, uh, u plus v, we're doing the little k equals 2 case here just for simplicity, uh, that equals 0 uh, if f is alternating. Uh, but then by multilinearity, this is equal to uh, f of u u plus f of u v plus uh, f of v u plus f of v v, just by uh, sort of expanding this out uh, by multilinearity. Now the u u term and the v v term are both zero. So you have a f of u v plus f of v u. And, um, all right, so what do you see now? You see that um, uh, f of u v equals the negative of f of v u. All right, so this is the property that uh, you really want to call alternating. It says when you switch two of the arguments, then you change the sign here. All right, so you apply an argument uh, that's, that's basically the same as what I wrote down here um, for any number, uh, for any value of the little k. And you get the following. So if uh, if sigma is a permutation, so S k is the symmetric group that permutes uh, the numbers one through k, then uh, f of v one up to v k is equal to the sine of sigma times f of v sigma one. Uh, up to v sigma k. All right, so if you do some permutation, an arbitrary permutation of the arguments of f, uh, then that just changes the value of the multilinear function, uh, of an alternating multilinear function by uh, the sign of the permutation. And remember, the sign of a permutation is the, the number of transpositions you need um, to make the permutation. Let me give you a couple of examples of alternating maps that you've probably seen before. So the determinant is a map that takes uh, uh, kn, so think of that as your vector space v, and then you're going to take n copies of that and uh, map it to uh, the ground field k, so that's uh, k to the 1 power. All right, and, and of course I'm thinking of uh, k to the n to the n as the set of uh, n by n matrices, right? Something like that. Okay, and, and, and of course the determinant is alternating. If you interchange uh, two rows of a matrix, that changes the determinant by a sign. Um, that's exactly what we want. If two rows are the same, then the determinant is zero. All right, so that, this is maybe the, the most, one of the most important examples of alternating, of an alternating map. Um, another one that, that you may remember is the cross product. So uh, in, in R3, let's say, or maybe uh, K3 is, is fine. Uh, we had a, a V cross W. This formula right here, um, if, if you write down V as a uh, coordinates of V as A's and the coordinates of W as B's, then you have A2, B3 minus A3, B2, A3, B1 minus A1, B3, etc. Of course, the, the way you're supposed to kind of uh, think about this uh, is that you're supposed to look at the two by two matrix right here. And then uh, and then and then these entries here are just the various two by two minors. So the two by two minors of this matrix. So the, the first entry here is the minor you obtain by deleting the first column and and so on. Uh, I think maybe with some signs. Okay, so yeah, is this alternating? Well, you can see by this uh, description with uh, with with the 
with the miners of a matrix that it is alternating, right? If you interchange uh, the first row and the second row, that I'll just change the signs uh, of all the miners. So this is this is alternating. Good. Now we're ready to define uh, the alternating tensor product of a vector space. All right, so here's the, here's the definition. Uh, the k-fold, this is a little k, uh, alternating tensor product of a vector space V uh, is a vector space T uh, together with a multilinear map, an alternating map, uh, uh, from V to K into T, uh, satisfying uh, the universal property. Okay, and what's the universal property? The universal property is that uh, for every uh, alternating map, uh, of course, uh, a k fold multilinear map, f from vk to some vector space w, uh, there's a unique. A unique G from a T to W uh, that makes the diagram commute. Okay, in other words, that the, um, let me write this correctly F equals uh, G of tau. Okay, so we have to draw the diagram so we know what we're talking about. So VK um, to W, so tau is the map. As part of the definition of the alternating tensor product, and then uh, we have it exists a unique G. All right, so this is sort of the the alternating tensor product is sort of the, the source of, of all the uh, alternating linear maps, right? Any alternating linear map has to factor through T. That's the idea. Okay, and here's our um, our proposition slash uh, some notation. It says that uh, uh, k-fold uh, alternating tensor products uh, always exist. And are unique. A unique up to isomorphism. All right, so uh, we will write uh, a wedge k of v uh, for for a t. So uh, where v is the vector space and k is k is the number, um, and we'll write. Uh, v1 wedge dot dot dots uh, wedge vk and this will be how we write a uh, tau of a v1 of vk all right so remember tau is the map that takes you know k vectors and sends them into uh, the alternating tensor product and so we'll just write that as, as the, the wedge here like this okay good I just realized I forgot to write uh, this map here is called tau. I wrote it down on the diagram, but right there you go. Okay, um, we're not going to do the whole proof, but, but the idea, if you already know how to construct a tensor product, is uh, you can take a, a wedge kv, this is our t, you can just have it be uh, v, the k-fold tensor product of v, right? And then you have to mod out by uh, relations like um, uh, v1 tensor v1 something like this uh, 
you got to mod out by the subspace generated by uh, tensor products to have uh, repeated entries, right? And uh, once you do that, you, you know, you, you turn this into a, an alternating thing. Okay, so uh, I think maybe that's all I'll say about the proof. Um, but there you have it. And uh, I think I mentioned this uh, before in our class. Whenever you define something with a universal property like this, uh, you usually get uh, uh, uniqueness uh, for uh, as kind of a, almost a freebie. You can kind of prove it formally. So that's nice. Okay, here's some important remarks. So let's recall that for the tensor product, um, you know, if, if we have a u1 up to uh, en as a, ba as a basis for v, then um, the set of all uh, vectors of the form e uh, i1 tensor up to e i k um, this is a, is a basis for the tensor product, right? The k-fold tensor product. Okay, uh, I want to know what's a, a basis for uh, the alternating uh, tensor product, the uh, wedge kv. And so I, I look at these, and the thing you notice is if there's any repeated entries, then it's zero, so we won't need that in the basis. And also, uh, you can interchange any two entries and just change the sign. So what you can do is kind of sort them um, into kind of like a, an ascending thing. So so it kind of follows that uh, uh, e1 or e i1 wedge dot 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 e i k the set like this uh, with the indices sorted. Uh, you can take this to be a basis for the alternating tensor product. In particular, we now know the dimension of the alternating tensor product. Um, how many uh, sequences are there like this? Uh, well, it's just n choose k, right? You just got to choose uh, k vectors uh, out of the, the, the basis of n vectors. And uh, and uh, no repeats are allowed and uh, order doesn't matter. All right, so that's exactly n choose k. All right, so that's, that's remark A. Uh, let's look at remark B. Uh, let's think about the wedge is zero. We're kind of taking zero copies of V. So that just gives you back the ground field k. You can think about that. And uh, wedge one of v, well then in this case the alternating product does nothing because you can't interchange two things because there's only one thing. So this is just uh, v itself again. Okay, uh, and then the more interesting case is um, wedge n of v, where where the dimension of, of v is equal to n. So if you take the wedge equal to the dimension of the vector space, uh, what is what is the dimension of this? Well, uh, according to our formula, this is um, This is equal to n choose n, which is one, right? Uh, and and what, what is exactly this map? Uh, you can view this map, a tau from uh, vn to, uh, to a wedge n of v, a one-dimensional vector space, uh, is just the determinant. All right, so you, you take uh, n, n vectors from an n-dimensional vector space, and you take their determinant, and you get an answer in a one-dimensional vector space, okay? Uh, so you can think about that. I guess this is the de this is the standard determinant if um, if you know you fix a basis here. For our example C, we're going to return to the cross product. So let's uh, let V be a three-dimensional vector space over K, uh, spanned with a basis uh, e1, e2, and e3, and a little v will be a vector with coordinates a1 through a3, and the little w will be a vector uh, with coordinates uh, b. Let's uh, let's look at the wedge two of v, so the, the second alternating tensor power, and look at a v wedge w, which will be an element of 
wedge 2 of e. Let's try and compute it in the standard basis that we uh, mentioned earlier. So what's going to be the coefficient of e1? So the standard basis, right, is that e1 and wedge e2, e1 wedge e3, and e2 wedge e3. There's only three ways to put two vectors in order if uh, from this uh, basis, right? All right, so what's the coefficient of e1 wedge e2? Well, there's a a1 e1 from v and a b2 e2 from w, so you can so you get a coefficient a1 b2. Uh, the other way to, to get this is you can take the a2 e2 from from v and the b1 e1 from w, um, so you get uh, a1 or a2 b1 rather. Okay, but you need to introduce a sign here because they're in the wrong order, right? Uh, the v was on the left, so that would mean the e2 is on the left, and so you'd end up with e2 wedge e1. That's perfectly fine, but it's not the same as e1 and wedge e2. You have to put a minus sign to switch the sides. Okay, and then and then you do the same thing for the other ones. So right here we'll have uh, a1 b3 minus a3 b1, and over here you'll have a2 b3 minus uh, a3 B2. This should look very familiar to us. Uh, it's very similar to the cross product. In fact, if we kind of uh, match things up here, E1, E2 should match up with like E3 and E1, E2 should match up with E2. Probably want this to be minus E2 and E2, E3 should match up with E1. Um, then it's exactly the cross product. Um, let's uh, let's say the same thing in, in kind of the language we were using before. So here we have a V cross V mapping to V via the cross product, right? And that is an alternating multilinear map, so it has to factor through the wedge product, the, the um, alternating tensor product here. Um, so, so this map is the standard tau, and uh, this is the unique G uh, here. Oh, well, what is the unique G? Uh, exactly uh, this map here, right? G that I described a second ago. That That's how uh, um, tau factors, or that's how, um, yeah, um, we factor through the, the cross product. That's how the cross product factors through tau. That's what I want to say. Okay, and, um, and, and so we have this, you know, uh, wedge 2 of v is isomorphic to v, only works for dimension 3. Uh, in fact, probably it's more natural to, to say uh, v dual, and you can think about exactly uh, why that is, and that has to do, that also will explain this sign here. Right? I think the reason you have a negative sign uh, on the E2 is because if you kind of uh, append one of these vectors on the end, you have E1, wedge E2, wedge E3, they're all in the, the right order. But if you have E1, E3, E2, you're going to take one transposition to get them back into the right order. Uh, where there is E2, E3, E1 is going to take two transpositions, so you get the signs cancel out. Okay. All right. Um, so maybe the first time you saw the cross product, uh, it, was, it was maybe kind of strange uh, or it seemed kind of arbitrary, um, or at least to me it did. Uh, this makes it seem, um, I don't know, more natural maybe, and also kind of explains why it only works in three dimensions, right? I mean, it's true, you can do kind of the same thing and take uh, V n minus one to uh, wedge of V uh, will be isomorphic to V dual uh, when uh, V is uh, dimension n, right? Uh, but then that's a, a product of n vectors, not a product of two vectors. So if you want a thing that's a product, which is two things, it kind of has, uh, that works like the cross product, uh, it only works for dimension three, so. I don't know. Okay, now we're going to say actually uh, generalize this. So I'll look at this formula uh, one more time. So we have here just uh, sort of the minors of the matrix. And the coefficients here, you notice, are just uh, the minors of the matrix that you get by sticking uh, V and W into a matrix. So uh, that holds in general. So let me try and write down the general statement. So in general, Let's have a v, uh, v vector space of dimension n with some fixed basis. And then let's try and compute uh, the coefficient of, a, of an arbitrary uh, wedge product in, in the kind of standard 
basis. So we're going to take a sum over uh, indices like this, i1 less than or equal to i2 up to uh, ik, so they have to be sorted. And uh, we want to know what is the coefficient of e i1 wedge e i2 wedge e i k. So this is the, the standard basis. Uh, and what is the coefficient here? Well, what you have to do is just take uh, i1, just take the i1 uh, through i k uh, minor of the matrix that you get uh, just by putting uh, the v1 the v's into a matrix okay and of course i'm what i mean by this is you write uh, v1 in terms of the the standard basis e1 through en and um and, and similarly for the rest of them and just put those entries into this matrix all right so you will get uh what is this this is a k by n matrix and you want a, a k k times n this is a k by n matrix and uh, and then you take all the the k uh, minors right so you just pick k columns corresponding to the i's and take the determinant of that sub matrix and that will be exactly uh, the coefficient of of this standard basis element here okay i won't say too much more about the proof uh, except for a look at the example that we did before um, and you can think about uh, the general case all right so a nice consequence of this uh, is, a, is a very important property of alternating tension products so uh, let's let v1 through uh, vk uh, B in uh, in Kn, so that's like our V from before. Um, then uh, V1 wedge up to Vk uh, equals zero uh, if and only if if a V1 through Vk are are linearly dependent. All right, so so. Um, these alternating tensor products uh, detect linear dependence. All right, uh, we already knew that if uh, two of these repeated, you know, if, if two of the Vs uh, were repeated, then we'd get zero. That was the, pro the alternating property. And of course, that's the, that would mean that they're linearly dependent. But this lemma is saying that it detects all kinds of linear dependence, even if it's more, even if it's more complicated. All right, uh, what's the proof? Well, we know that, um, that uh, these are linearly dependent dependent uh, if and only if uh, uh, all maximal minors vanish. So we've used that fact a few times in this class. And I mean all the maximal minors of the matrix whose entries come from V, like we talked about before. Okay, but according to uh, this thing that we just talked about up here, all maximal minors vanishing is the same thing as is uh, v1 through wedge through vk uh, being zero okay so that, that's that's how that goes but of course when a k is equal to n uh, you just get the familiar property of the determinant the determinant you know uh, detects uh, linear dependence um, okay let's look at the next lemma so uh, let's let uh, v1 through uh, vk uh, B in Kn, and also let's uh, have W1 through w Wk also in Kn, um, and they're both uh, linearly independent sets. Uh, linearly independent sets. Okay, then the alternating tensor products or the wedge products. Um, will be scalar multiples of each other so let me say then this is true for some lambda uh, in k if and only if um, they have, uh, these vectors have the same span Uh, 
All right. So now you're starting to see how this is going to, the stuff we're talking about is going to be useful for gross mining because we really want to know uh, when two, uh, uh, two bases uh, represent the same subspace. And this is telling us how we can detect that. If you have a two, uh, two possible bases, bases for subspaces and their uh, uh, exterior products or the wedge products, alternating tensor products, they have lots of names. Uh, if they are scalar multiples of each other, uh, that is exactly characterizing when they span the same subspace. Let's do the proof. So uh, let's do the forward direction first. Um, so, so we're assuming that the, the wedge products differ only by a scalar multiple. Let's take uh, WI and, and wedge it onto both sides. Then uh, the, the scalar can just uh, move out to the front like this. All right, uh, what about this, this thing here? This is zero because WI appears twice in it. All right, uh, now we have a WI a wedge with all the Vs is equal to zero, um, but this here, uh, implies that uh, um, wi v1 up to vk is linearly dependent. Uh, but in other words, that means that uh, wi is in the span of uh, v1 through vk. Okay, but that works for all the w's, so that means that um, the span of uh, the W's is contained in the span of the V's. Okay, but there was nothing special about um, uh, about doing the W's first, so uh, you get the reverse, reverse inclusion the same way, so these are equal. Let's do now do the other direction. So now we're assuming that they both span the same subspace and we want to show that the, uh, the wedge products differ only by a scalar. So if they both span the sub same subspace, uh, then uh, the basis W1 through WK uh, can be obtained uh, from uh, the basis W, uh, the basis V. Uh, by a finite sequence of transformations. Sequence of transformations. Uh, that look like this. You, you, you just take a VI and uh, map it to VI plus lambda VJ. Uh, or, you, or you do things like a VI maps to lambda VI. So if you just uh, do this do transformations like this enough times you can turn the V's into W's, right? Um, but the point is each of these uh, won't change, will only change the wedge product by, by a scalar, right? So, you know, if you, for example, if you had a V1 wedge, uh, uh, V2 plus uh, lambda V1. So I'll just do, do an example here. Uh, so, so what did I do? I replaced uh, V2 with uh, V2 plus lambda V1. Um, by linearity, that's just, uh, that will be equal, oops, let me get my eraser here. That will, by linearity, that will be equal to uh, V1 wedge uh, V2 wedge uh, V3 up to VK plus lambda uh, V1 wedge v1 wedge v3 up to vk but this second the second term is zero because v1 appears twice so we can just cross that out and okay so it's exactly the same and and then you can think about if you do this one uh, you'll just uh, because it's linear the lambda just comes out to the front so it just changes it by a scalar factor in fact uh, if you think about it uh, this is really what's happening. If, if you have a change of basis matrix, right, something like a WI equals B, uh, VI, 
or, or just a linear map. We don't even have to pick a pick another basis. This, um, so if, if wi equals b times vi, we know that b is an invertible uh, linear map because uh, it's maps a, a basis to a basis. This is the same b for each i. Uh, then the wedges of, of the w's will just be equal to uh, the determinant of b times uh, w1 through or v1 through vk. So now we're ready to def define uh, the Pluger embedding. So this will be a map from our Grassmannian into a projective space. All right, so let's take our Grassmannian of k-dimensional subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space, and we're going to map it into uh, P n choose k minus 1. And uh, what's the map going to be? It's going to take um, the span of uh, v1 through vk. So pick pick some basis for your k-dimensional subspace. So we'll write it like that. And we'll just map it to a v1 wedge vk. Uh, thought of as an element of oh wedge k of v. Now we're ready to define the Pluger embedding. This will be a map from our Grassmannians into projective space. So uh, we're going to take the Grassmannian of k-dimensional subspaces of a fixed vector space of dimension n, and we're going to map it into P n choose k uh, minus 1. All right, I think it's uh, helpful here to, to give a name to some of our vector spaces. So I'm, I'm going to think of this grass mining as, as a k dimensional subspaces uh, of a vector space v of dimension n. All right, and I think of this projective space as, as one dimensional subspaces. of the wedge k of v. All right, so remember wedge k of v has dimension uh, n choose k, um, so the projective space associated to, to it has dimension one lower. All right, what is the map? We'll call it f for now. Uh, it will take the span of a v1 through vk. So if you have a k-dimensional subspace, you can pick uh, some basis for it. And then we'll map that to v1 wedge v2 wedge up to vk. Or rather the, the span of v1 wedge up to vk. All right, first uh, we need to think about whether this map is well defined. Um, so this is this this is the span of one vector in the wedge k of v space. So that that makes sense. It's always going to be a one represent a one-dimensional subspace as long as v1 wedge through vk is non-zero. But I believe we just barely proved a lemma about that. Um, this one right here, um, it's equal to zero if and only if the v1 through vk are linearly dependent. But v1 through vk in, in, in our case is supposed to be a basis, right? So so we're good that way. Uh, the other thing we should worry about is what if you picked a different basis? What if uh, you had a W1 through WK who spanned the same subspace? Would you then map to the same one-dimensional subspace in uh, the projective space? And the answer to that, of course, is this lemma right here. Um, if the spans are the same, uh, well, if and only if the spans are the same, uh, the wedge products differ by a scalar multiple, so they will span the same one-dimensional subspace. All right, so this is a, a very nice uh, embedding that, that maps uh, these k-dimensional linear subspaces to one-dimensional subspaces of projective space. One-dimensional subspace of, of a vector space, and the one-dimensional subspaces are points of the projective space. That's what I should say. Let's look at some examples. So first, the sort of an easy example, let's look at a G11 uh, with the Pluger map. So this will map to um, Pn minus 1. And what does it do? It just takes the span of one vector 
of V and maps it to uh, the span of the same vector V, right? So in the case of G1N, uh, the Pluker embedding is just the isomorphism, right? G1N is isomorphic to Pn minus one because they're the same thing, right? G1N is the one dimensional subspaces of an n-dimensional vector space. That's the same thing as, as Pn minus one. Okay, let's do a slightly more interesting one. Let's look at uh, G2, Three uh, mapping into uh, P. What do we have? Three choose two minus one. That's uh, P two. All right, and let's just uh, take an example vector. So let's take the span of E one plus E two and uh, E one plus E three. Uh, what does that map to over here? Well, we just have to take the wedge of these two vectors. Um, let me erase that. Okay, and uh, when we do this, well, we can expand this out. E1, the wedge E1 is 0. E1 wedge E3 is right there. Uh, E2 wedge E1 well, is the same as minus uh, E1 wedge E2. And then the last thing we have is uh, plus E2 wedge E3. All right, and... Um, and these numbers that we get here, you know, if, if uh, maybe we, we'd like to write them in some reasonable order, but let me just write them like this. These are called the, uh, the Pluker coordinates. Right, the, the, you take the standard basis um, uh, for the wedge product, for the, for the alternating tensor product. And, uh, and then the coefficients there will be the Pluker coordinates. And uh, re recall by our lemma that we looked at earlier that these are just the maximal minors, right? Uh, so, so maximal minors. In this case, uh, the matrix is uh, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. That, uh, that, of course, this is E1 plus E2. This is E1 plus E3, so we have uh, we have this minor here as determinant uh, minus one. Uh, this minor here has determinant one, and then the the one three minor uh, also has determinant one. So one three has determinant one. So there's our three things: one one and minus one. And let's say this one more time too. If you picked a different basis for the same subspace that's spanned by E1 plus E2 and E1 plus E3, uh, that would just correspond uh, to row operations on this matrix, right? You might add a multiple of one row to the other row or multiply a row by a scalar, but, but any of those operations will just change the Pluker coordinates by a common scalar, multiplying by a common scalar. So you still get the same point of projective space. All right, so I'm thinking of this as uh, this here as a homogeneous coordinates in P2. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll show that the image of the Pluger map is a closed subset of the projective space, and then we'll be able to identify uh, the Grassmannian uh, as, as a projective variety. Um, I guess one thing I didn't say that we should say uh, before we end is that this uh, this Pluker embedding is in fact injective. How do we know it's injective? Well, let's say that we have uh, two of these uh, two of these spans that map to the um, to the same uh, to the same uh, wedge product here. Uh, then we have the this this lemma here, right? That uh, if 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 these two wedge products are equal up to a scalar, uh, then then they must have represented the same subspace. So that's exactly what we want to show that the Pluker map is injective.